Looking at all of that, of course, through the eyes of 20th century Ireland, we look here then to have been backward and primitive people. And backward or primitive, I would have thought too, from the fact that we had the cows and the hens here in the house of us well into 20th century Ireland. And why was that? Well, when we look at the population of Mayo in 1870, it stood at around 260,000 people. So for a start, we must realise that there were large families in houses like this. 13, 14, 15, 16 children was not uncommon. Those families cultivated an average of two acres of crops for survival, mainly potatoes, on seven, eight, nine, and ten acre holdings, which left them therefore with five, six, or seven or eight acres of pasture. What animals can they hold? I believe a cow and a donkey and a goat and a pig from time to time. The tax system, not defining them between habitation for man and animal, resulted when many of those houses were built, they were a two-room structure and often just a single room. In this case here, this was a two-roomed house. All of this section was one room. This immediate wall was not there at all. That's a later addition. The animals were tied against the bottom gable wall and the hens then rested on a beam going from the front door to the back. There was nothing wrong with that. That was common across Europe. So what made us different for us to have felt backward people? As far as I could gather, it was the fact that we cleaned out from those animals and poultry and we stacked the dung then out in front of the house that gave us the primitive look. And it may very well have been the reason why we were termed and known for generations after as the dirty Irish. Why did we stack the dung in front of the house? Why was it not taken and stacked at least to the rear of the house? Was it simply that yes, we were a lazy or an ignorant people that didn't know nor care less? If that was so, one would have to ask now too, would we accept here that we were sacrificing the well-being of children? For we do know that mortality was high. I didn't think that the Irish were any more primitive than anywhere else, so I believed therefore there had to be a reason as to why the dung was taken and stacked within three to five feet of the front door. So I continually kept to ask why. The most interesting answer that I got them to that question that at least made sense to me came from an old woman at Corrie in County Sligo 17 or 18 years ago. That woman was nearly 100 years of age when I recorded her and she lived to be 103. She said that when the Irish people became tenants to the land they made an agreement. One, they would service and maintain the land. Two, they would pay rent. Both of the charters running equal of importance. The reality though was, she said for many of them, when they did become tenants, realised that they didn't have the means to pay the rent, but equally recognised the consequences, and the consequences of course was eviction. So she said many engaged in psychology, where they cleaned out from the animals, stacked the dung in front of the door, because when the landlord comes, if they don't have the rent, they can say, Sir, I have a pity manure there, sir, to service your land, sir. What other servicing, she said, could those people do to land at that time? but to make sure that the stone walls were built, the water courses were open and hedges were trimmed, for which he could see for himself. He was now standing on the pit of Fermi of Manure. There she said the basics for 50% of their agreement. The 50% that they weren't able to honour was at that given time they didn't have money to part with, and hopefully he might have some scintilla of understanding and at least given them a chance. But unfortunately, she said in Mayo, they didn't get much of a chance. And that was compounded by the fact that many of the landlords in Mayo were absentees. Yes, 67% of them. Which resulted then in the rent being collected by agents who got commission of collecting money and got nothing for accepting psychology. Which then resulted in thousands of families being evicted or discarded from the landscape in Mayo. And what happened, she said, to the Davidson Strait was a classical example of that. And that was basically how I recorded that unique woman. Unique, I say, because she then put light on something that we were tending to allow others write about and fiction lies in relation to us. She mentioned the Davidson Strait, and I will refer to that family later. But first of all, in relation to that statement then of thousands of families, many people wondered and questioned, was that not a misquoted or an exaggerated statement taken from an old woman, for the word thousands then seemed to be excessive? So I then was to see was there any documented evidence that either supported or denied Mary Ellen McGuinn's statement and discovered that from 1847 to 1887, in that 40 year period alone, at least 14,500 families were evicted or discarded from the landscape of Mayo and calculated into human heads, conservatively put between 75 and 78,000 people. Or if you like, 
50,000 short the total population of Mayo today. Hence, therefore, we had the expression, Mayo, God help us. Mm. Even though it was over a 40-year period, it was an appalling statistic for many so-called civilised society. By the 1930s, 50% of the people here in this region had got rid of the animals and poultry from the house. The person that I would give much of the credit to for being responsible for that change was the nun that set up the windmills at Foxford, says the mother government. For she brought out an incentive for the girls that worked there if they could go home or convince mother and father for the animals and poultry from the house, she would give them blankets for beds. And that was the kind of a cultural change that came to this region, its motivation started within its own people. Unfortunately for many of them, the cultural change never came at all and the custom then was to die with its people. I don't blame the English solely for the way that we were treated, for I am well and truly aware too that there were Irish landlords and agents involved here mm -hmm. who were equally ruthless to us. <clears throat> in relation to the house itself, as I said to you, I lived here until 1970. Six of my family, four boys, two girls, that our bedroom. My mum and dad in the kitchen bed, and my grandmother self-contained in the top room. My grandmother was born in 1876 and died in 64, and I knew her for the guts of 11 years. So much of my information, of course, came from that source, or from all people that I've recorded here to in the region. And even by 1970, <coughs> the cooking was done here in the open fire. Not alone for humans, but for animals and poultry as well. This unit is temporary, it's not, it's not suitable for here at all, but it's economical for me to keep the temperature up in the house, otherwise the whole thing will fragment and break down. So when I take this pot-bellied stove out, it will allow the crane to the back of it to spin out an end. The crane carries the kittle, the oven to make the bread, and the big pots in the loft there, one at either end, that were used for boiling potatoes for humans, pigs and poultry. The two little seats either side of the fire, where we often sat as kids and done our lessons with the light of the fire. The cubby holds either side, up here you had snuff and tobacco, legal documents and religious books. Covered with a photograph of Pope Pius XII, later times by Pope John XXIII and later again by John F. Kennedy. The former two gave me an insight, an insight into a faith, the faith in a God and a God that took those people in through hard times. Over the room door you had the tea and the sugar and the salt, a candle for going up in the room, covered with a photograph of Michael Davitt. Why not or who was he? Well that family were evicted six miles from here at Strayed in 1850 for non-payment of rent. When evicted, they were taken to the workhouse at Swinford for a short period. Short, because Michael David was four and a half years old. He was to be separated from his mother. The mother didn't want that, so they left the workhouse, eventually immigrating to Haslington in Lancashire. Where then, at the age of nine, Michael David could work on a cotton mill? Unfortunately, at the age of eleven, he met with an accident in the mill. Feeding the cotton in, the mill jammed. He put in his right hand to pull it out, and the mill dragged him in, wrenching the right arm from his body. He recovered from that, minus his right arm, and he always fought then for the breaking up of landlordism, the distribution of the land for the Irish people, imprisoned many times for those ideals. And in 1877, when released from Dartmoor Prison, he returned here to Mayo, meeting with James Daly and Parnell, founded the Land League, the body that was eventually to break the hold of landlordism. And as Irish people, it is something that we can be proud about, and proud, I say, not just because David came from down the road here at Strayed, but proud because no government or institution throughout the world ever since, with all their power, might and wealth, with all the agitation that there is over land, no government has ever since been able to attain for its people what those attained for the Irish through the process of the Land League, where the land was taken through peaceful means and distributed freely to its people. And in saying that, Gandhi modelled himself on the aspirations and ideals of David Daly and Parnell, and the Parnell family, of course, were a Protestant family from Nottingham. And in light of the world in which we now find ourselves in, I think that it is nothing short of another disgrace to think that a little over a hundred years ago, this country was practically handed over free of debt, with very little charges attached. And a hundred years later, many of them the price of a breakfast, with some of our children going to school hungry. And I think that is totally unacceptable, and is a disgrace on those people whose trust the country was placed in. Over the front door then you had the filing system, and there were very few Irish families who could not identify with the crust of the papers in the court hanger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was interesting to me was why that hung there, the receipts. What was interesting to me was why it hung there. The answer given was fear. Evidence was often demanded from the people to produce evidence they paid for commodities. Can reach for it, put it in his puss, before he steps across the threshold of the door. 
for should he come across the threshold of the door, you are unable to produce evidence of payment, or unable to make payment again, you therefore could not remove him from the house till same was honoured. Hence the expression, there you are, sir, and never darken my door again. <laughs> this area of the house was referred to as the loft, where large families were concerned. Some children slept up there, but for us it was a place to store our clothes and shoes and boxes. Household utensils too up there and firm implements. The bath basin taken down on Saturday evening. A big pot of water boiled in the fire. And boys and girls were washed in the middle of the floor for Mass on Sunday. Mm -hmm. The big chest at the back, the trunk, coming in on the corner around 1935 from my granddad to my grandmother from New York, yeah. containing linen and clothes. Those parcels and trunks continually coming back right up to the 1980s from brothers, sisters, uncles or aunts. Not alone from America, but England too, and were always greatly appreciated when they did arrive. When the cow was milked, the milk was strained through the strainer into the crock. That milk a few days later then was put into churns to make into butter. And if you came to the house and were making a churning, you too had to give a hand. Otherwise they believed you came to crush the cow or steal the butter. <laughs> For a superstitious race we were and still are to some degree. The men from Connemara, from Mayo, from Sligo, from Leitrim, from Donegal, which was right down along the western seaboard. Many of those men had to emigrate and were known as migrant labourers. When they immigrated, many of them had only the bare passage in their pockets. How did they survive then, waiting weeks or months to get work or money? What did those people live off in the meantime? Well, many of them carried with them those cans. When they got to England, they got a contact, somebody who picked up the offal for them, livers, lights, lungs and sheep's heads. Then in large towns, there were places called kips, which gave them the rights to buy up that offal from which they made soup. Putting the soup into those cans, those cans were referred to as bagging cans and brewing cans. Brewing makes them out of the can light a fire along the road and reboil it. The can was taken home. We used it for bringing the raw to the hayfield or to the bog. Milk between neighbours, picking blackberries and milking the goat. Hence many now refer to them as billy cans. And in the year 2000, a man by the name of Ulton Crowley published a book, The Men Who Built Great Britain, many of whom were Irish navvies. That book was financed by many of the English construction companies. Stories of Irish navvies? A man who contributed to it was a man by the name of John Neary. John Neary visited here in 97. He was 93. It was he who told that story in relation to the Billy Can. For John Neary himself had published his own life story in a book, The Long Distant Kitty, published in the 60s. The washboard for washing our clothes and my satchel or school bag. Mm. We had no radios or televisions, but we entertained ourselves in singing, dancing, storytelling, music, arts and crafts, reading, visiting. Of course we had games. But during the winter nights the lads had made cradle birds to trap the singing birds. Mm -hmm. Made from sally rods into a pyramid. Another scallop coming around there in a the half moon. Propping it up then with a fork stick called a gaulog. We would be looking to trap goldfinches or linnets. But in earlier times my older brothers, they would have been after blackbirds. For they killed the blackbirds and eat them. We'd be looking for goldfinches or linnets, a singing bird. You throw a few crumbs of bread in the back, and the, the cradle will be set out under the hedges in the forest of the snow. And the little bird will come along, and unlike human beings, it won't be a smash and grab affair. He's not going to just fly and grab and gone. No, he'll survey the whole countryside as he comes along before he'll quench to risk his life. Eventually, coming to the cradle, he'll eventually hop on the cradle. I didn't set that right. Sure. He'll come to the cradle, eventually hopping on the tricker. He knocks it down on top of himself. So you took off your jacket and you threw your jacket across on top of him and kept him in the dark for a couple of minutes and he settled down. Then you caught your little bird, brought him in and put him into your bird cage. Mm. Ah. Put him into your bird cage, which we made too during winter nights. Mm. We walked two and a half miles to school from here. We wanted a piece of wire to make a bird cage. The piece of wire that we used with the spokes of old bicycles. Hopefully at the end of the year you'll have enough of those gathered to make a bird cage, for you must remember in the 50s, 60s, few had a bicycle. The little door to men. Held shut with a piece of wire and a small staple here on the bottom. On this side here you have the little trough for his feeding. A egg stand of water was put into him, and I find it then he hangs out to the front door chirping away. He was our spice girl as a Presley at that time. <laughs> 
Our diet was mainly bacon, cabbage and spuds. So when the pig was killed, the bacon was hard salted and three weeks later then it hangs on the roof of the kitchen, smoked with the smoke of the fire. Yeah. There was nothing wrong with that. It was healthy food. Yeah. 